All righty. Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you all for joining our last um, full committee meeting of the year. Congratulations <laughs> for making it, uh, for all of your hard work up until this point. I know um, things have moved really quickly uh, with all of our recommendations, but um, I'm really proud of where we've gotten so far. Um, so thank you all to our committee members for um, all of your attentiveness and hard work. Um, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, and a first order of business is public comment. Uh, staff, do we have anyone on the public comment line? All right, I will go ahead and open up the phone lines first. Okay, so if there's anyone on the phones, if you could please hit star six now to unmute yourself and start speaking for public comment. Okay, I don't think I hear anyone on the phones and I don't see any virtual hands raised. All righty, no problem. Uh, thank you. Uh, next item oh, on the agenda. Uh, Madam Chair, it looks like actually two hands went up last minute right after I said that. Um, no worries. <laughs> okay. uh, so it looks like our first public comment will be from uh, Molly McKinley. Uh, Molly, you have three minutes, and then at the end of three minutes, I will ask you to make your closing statement. So you have the floor. Great, thank you. Good morning, board, and thanks for hosting this public comment session. My name is Molly McKinley, and I serve as the vice chair of the Denver Streets Partnership. Um, I'm here to address a few issues briefly that have been discussed by this board on behalf of the Denver Streets Partnership. First, I just want to express our support for eliminating the fare box recovery ratio. The elimination of this policy will give the RTD um, the flexibility to lower fares and even make some transit service free. Because of this policy, RTD has one of the highest fares in the country, which disproportionately impacts low income populations who need access to transit the most. And next, while at the DSP, we don't know enough to strongly endorse any of the particular governance structures under consideration. We urge the committee to keep in mind one of the main findings of this scenario modeling that was done as part of Reimagine RTD, that prioritizing service for low-income households, communities of color, and people who don't own cars makes the service better for most everyone, as measured by the percent of the population that has access to frequent transit service, as well as overall transit ridership. Any changes to RTD's government structure should facilitate, not impede RTD's ability to achieve these outcomes. Thanks for your time and consideration. All right, thank you so much, uh, Molly. Our next public comment is from uh, Paolo Solorzano, and uh, I will unmute you now, and you have the floor, Paolo. Looks like you're just muted Hello. on your end. Hi, can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah, again, uh, this is Paolo. Again, I'm, I'm a rider. I'm not connected with any um, transportation. Um, you know, organizations yet, but um, like I said last time, I guess I, you know, that maybe wasn't the place to say it, but um, again, as far as equity and uh, increasing ridership and just even just serving the lower income, uh, most rural populations, I mean, I've been talking about scheduling right now um, for a while, and uh, it's just, it's been three years that the scheduling has not been um, uh syncing up whether it be the uh online rtd schedule or trip planner or it's tools oh. online they don't work uh they're not displaying the right uh scheduling so again as far as just having ridership increase i mean um i'd, I'd really uh love for you guys to just like look into this like um short term long term let's make sure this doesn't happen again because if if the trains aren't showing up on schedule and no one's going to use it people are being stranded it's a public safety issue. It's just all the way down the line. Um, and uh, even as far as just like equity, I mean, it, uh, you know, the, the, it's the highest rates in the, in the nation right now. Well, some of them, um, a lot of people can't afford it. And if the bus doesn't show up for like, you know, in a half hour or an hour, then you're being put there in a situation as a low income homeless person, whatever, you don't have the money, you might end up in jail. Um, who knows, you might get in a scuffle. You might just like, you, yeah, you're going to miss, miss your appointment. I mean, people who are disabled. I mean, that's going on right now. It's been going on for three years. 
Um, it's been documented. I've got a lot of documentation about that. There's not much out there on the press, but um, yeah, I've been reaching out to various staff members um, over the years, actually definitely years, um, about this really basic thing. And I, I've been going, well, I've been watching a lot of committees and, you know, uh, listening into committees, and I just don't see this, uh, the concrete stuff being talked about right now, like like this, like scheduling. I know there's a lot of budget talks and all that, but like, it just won't matter. It won't matter to anybody. Uh, and again, nobody's showing up to these things, right? But um, like, it won't matter to the, non, the, the, the lower income population, the most vulnerable, the, the people who are being criminalized, like if the schedules don't even work, that just shows just where the service is at um, and, and the, 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 the manner that RTD is like, uh, the perspective that RTD is taking on these, on, on us, on me. So, I mean, that's it. I'm just bringing that up again. I, I just hope somebody catches on to this. Um, it's just scheduling, scheduling. This is so basic to accountability and just like operations, everything. Thanks. All right, thank you for your comments, Paolo. Um, oh, I thought I did see another hand, but I do not see it any longer. So I do not see any, oh, there we go. Uh, looks like our next uh, public comment is from Lauren Hansen. Lauren, you'll have three minutes, and at the end of three minutes, I'll ask you to make your closing statements. So you have the floor. You just need to unmute yourself. Absolutely, can all y'all hear me? Okay, great. Uh, my name is Lauren Hansen, and uh, I am the uh, founder of a nonprofit organization here in Denver called Roll Anywhere Denver. And I'm also a moderator for a Facebook meme page called RTD Memes for Front Range Teens. But today I'd speak to you as a private citizen and would also agree with the statement by Molly McKinley from Denver Streets Partnership about eliminating the fare box requirement. RTD has some of the highest rates in the nation topping that of NYC, even though your dollar in New York City uh, goes a lot further for a ticket than it does in, you know, the city, county of Denver and surrounding areas. Limiting the fare box requirement is a thing that would help increase equity, and I believe is a fantastic thing to look into. Have a good rest of your day, all y'all. I'm done. All right, thank you for your comments, Lauren. Uh, and at this time, I do not see any other hands raised for public comment. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have more public comment. <laughs> so I think that's a really wonderful thing. Um, just a quick note, I think uh, one of the um, the gentleman, uh, Mr. Solorzano, uh, has spoken here before, and it seems like it's the same issue he's dealing with. So. I just want to make sure I know that um, staff had reached out to um, connect with him individually, but I just want to um, flag that again. I, I, I think if he can't even get an accurate schedule, I, it sounds like it's impacting him personally at this moment and, and others as well. So um, just wanted to flag that. I don't know if uh, that's up for the um, our RTD board members who are on the line um, to connect with him. Um, seeing some head nods. Um, can we just get another follow up? I, I, you know, it's it's tough. You know, it's snowing. Um, things aren't showing up on time. It, it seems like a a simple ask, but clearly something's you know not working. Carol, uh, you stay. Yeah, if I could just make a quick comment. I've noticed at the beginning of these meetings, um, it's not really clearly stated how the public can participate in public comments. So I'm just wondering if moving forward, we can begin by at least um, setting some ground rules or at least giving the public a better sense of how to engage in the public comments process so that their voices could be heard um, during the time that's allotted to them on the agenda. That's a really great observation and suggestion. Um, in other meetings, and you know, we can talk about this offline. In other meetings, there we have a specific staff person who makes an announcement every time we, um, I guess, change topics uh, in the conversation. Uh, but perhaps before we get into any business, we can explore, um, you know, a recorded message or some sort of instructions on how to do that, or maybe just the chair. Um, uh, reminding the, the public on how to comment and kind of the topics, um, uh, you know, for consideration of the day. Thanks, Dea. Okay, perfect. Uh, next agenda item is our uh, accountability committee, committee meeting summary uh, from November 9th. Um, 
quickly uh, to the to the team. Do we have any edits? Are we okay with those that meeting summary? Thumbs up, head nods, not hearing any objection. <laughs> uh, already, perfect. Um, then those are approved. Um, and then next, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our new RTD CEO and general manager, Deborah Johnson. She's gonna, she's joined us today, um, a new member to the state and to the group, but um, really excited for um, you know, your leadership and um, looking forward to working with you in the future. And I know we all um, are as well. So Deborah, do you want to take the floor? Um, we're not able to hear you. Can you hear me now? Hear me now? Can. Oh, there's a bit of an echo. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Hold on. I can't hear you all, though. Well, we're muted, some of us. Okay. All right. I can hear you all. Good morning. And first and foremost, thank you for the opportunity to come before you. As introduced, I'm Deborah Johnson. Uh, the newly minted general manager and CEO. And interestingly enough, you guys are going over the meeting summary from November 9th. That was actually my first day. So hence, this is my first meeting. And I wanna thank you all for the very important and significant work that you're undertaking on behalf of the betterment of the Regional Transportation District. And for those that rely and utilize the system as a whole, having educated myself on your charter and the task before you, I commend you uh, for taking, uh, for standing up and taking a charge because basically, for some of you that I've engaged with thus far, recognizing the transportation is literally a viable uh, vehicle that basically meshes communities together and promotes, uh, and promotes connectivity and allows um, individuals to be unleashed from their limitations. And hearing the public commenter uh, before, um, it's disconcerting to me sitting in this seat now, uh, you know, as we talk about having you know missed service and things of the like because ultimately as i shared with members of my board everything is built around the schedule you can't have a viable transportation network until you have an identifiable schedule and then from that you build out everything else in relationship to planning how many vehicles you need operators the network and you know congestion management and things of the like and more so all the money is built into the schedule as well so um i just wanted to take this brief moment to introduce myself what I think may be advantageous for all of you, if you have any questions that I can entertain, because I just don't want to ramble, I want to be helpful and also recognize that you have a myriad of things on the agenda. I want to ensure that I am becoming aware of what those issues are and can lend support as it relates to me working in tandem with our board, as well as members of our team, should there need to be clarifying information or serve as a subject matter expert in the space. Uh, recognizing that I do have some years of experience in public transportation, overseeing complex transportation networks and recognizing that it's not always going to be the best situation for all, but in my, in my capacity, what I want to try and ensure is that we're providing a comprehensive network that you know, provide those options uh, to others that may not have a myriad of them. And ultimately, as we talk about equity, transit equity is very, very important to me. Having grown up on public transport and, you know, utilizing it throughout the course of my secondary career in college and grad school, it's paramount to me that we have a system here in this region that is of use to the vast majority of the populace. So with that, I will yield the floor and um, try and address any questions anybody may have for me. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Deborah. Elise. Yeah, Deborah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we're really excited uh, about your arrival at RTD and in Colorado, and really look forward to working with you. We, um, as I think you know through um, various conversations that Crystal and I have had with you and with your um, RTD board members that are working on a, um, a set of recommendations. Um, we're pl planning on um, submitting an interim report in early January and I believe some of the content of that that those initial recommendations has been um, uh, mentioned to you but I uh, but love to start the dialogue with you uh, uh, on your thoughts on some of the things that we're looking at and there's sort of three big buckets. Um, one is uh, some legislative changes that we'll be going over in a few minutes um, to create more flexibility for RTD in both um, 
generating revenues, but perhaps even uh, equally uh, important is uh, increasing ridership. So dealing with things like um, reducing the requirements around fare box recovery, um, facilitating transit-oriented development on RTD properties, um, giving more flexibility around charging for parking, for parking and, and the like. And another bucket that's particularly important is re-examining the governance structure to create a, a, a partnership between RTD and the local governments uh, and communities it serves so that they have more uh, decision-making and buy-in with regards to service planning and delivery in their communities such that we can rebuild trust locally and regionally and perhaps open the doors to future revenue generation as a result of that. And then DEA subcommittee is, is diving deep on uh, examining the fares and passes that RTD has in order to make them simpler, easier to use, more equitable, um, with an eye towards um, really facilitating ridership amongst transit-reliant populations. So those are some of the areas of inquiry that we um, have focused on initially. Love to get your initial thoughts on any of those buckets. I know that's a, that's a whole lot, but I, I just wanted to sort of throw it open to you if you have any initial impressions or thoughts. In particular, I think you have, well, you have experience on all of them, but I know the governance structure and working with local communities is something that's um, directly in, in some of your recent experience. So love to hear your thoughts. Thank you very much, Elise, and thanks for outlining um, what you all have been putting forward. And I did have an opportunity, thanks to members of the board, to have a briefing, and I, and I can share some preliminary thoughts with me. I think these are all great undertakings, but I would be remiss in my comments not to state that ultimately there is one strategy in which we need to have, and some of the other things that you have raised are byproducts of that. So when we talk about ridership, what is the ultimate goal with ridership, right? Is it to generate revenue? And if it's if that is the cause or if that is the outcome that we're seeking, then what tactics are we going to leverage to get there? So when we talk about fares, we need to look at it in such a way. We want to ensure that there is equity amongst our fares. We want to ensure that people most reliant on transit have a way to access uh, these fare programs, hoping that we would attract a uh, demographics that range uh, throughout the population that would later utilize transit then to have the outcome be a surge in ridership. It's the same as we talk about the other aspects of getting, you know, local governments involved is the ultimate region, uh, excuse me, is the ultimate reason to get, you know, regional governments involved is that their constituents will have a more viable means of transport, which would lead to ridership. So I think we need to look at it you know, in relationship to this is our ultimate objective, these are the strategies we're going to leverage, and these are the tactics, because all of them have intersectionality. When we just say we want to increase ridership, it's like, okay, why? And so when I look at this, I think it's a good approach, but it just needs to be um, sort of coupled down into actually what are we trying to address, what is the core problem we are trying to address, and then ultimately what's the outcome? listening to the public comments before when I heard about the service aspect, ultimately from my vantage point, increase in increasing ridership, I want to promote, you know, customer satisfaction. It's different from customer service. So I want to have promoters that are talking about the service because even though I may have other options, ultimately when I go out and I tell people about how great the service is, that's also going to basically be a surge in relationship to ridership. So you have all these byproducts that go together, and as I say, they're interwoven. As it relates to the um, the whole notion of working with uh, different constituencies as well as elected boards, I do think that's vitally, vitally important. Um, as we take that step forward, I often feel like when somebody has some skin in the game, um, there's a different approach that's taken, and I think that's achievable as well, recognizing that RTD does have some subject matter expertise when it comes to service planning, and we have to have an understanding of what might work best, and I don't want to use technical terms here, but in the sense of optimizing the efficiencies, because as I said in my opening comments, when we talk about um, finances and budgets, it's all in the schedule because we're talking about revenue service hours because they're encapsulated in 
how much does it cost to put a vehicle on the road because you're talking about supervisorial staff, you're talking about doing preventative maintenance. It's not just about putting an operator in a bus out there. So we do need to look at it holistically when we make those decisions about service planning, trying to see how we can maximize um, you know, the taxpayer dollars and how we can get a better bang for our buck in relationship to headways and things of the like. And then more specifically, um, there was a question that was raised on the governance aspect of our board. Um, and I'm going to be very forthright in my comment. I, I saw some, you know, should it be elected board versus appointed board? I think the main issue is to address the name of the committee. It's about being accountable. And so basically, if there's requirements as it relates to somebody having transportation acumen, if it boils down to how many times somebody should utilize the system, so basically they know what they're uh, representing, it's the same thing. I, I often say it's analogous to having a restaurant and you're managing the restaurant and you never eat at it. How are you gonna be actually uh, able to speak about the experience that diners are having? So I think if anything, um, open to the aspects of what it is we're trying to do, but trying to better understand the ultimate issue we're trying to address. So with all of that, I think that's a high level uh, response, uh, but be more than happy when the time is appropriate to delve a little deeper and have conversations as you all see fit. So thank you very much, Elise, for broaching that. Thanks for that, Deborah. You're welcome. Are there any other members of the committee who would like to address uh, Deborah at this time? No, okay. Oh, Julie, yes, go ahead. Hi, hi Deborah. I just wanted to introduce myself. My name is Julie Mowica. I'm really excited that you're here and really looking forward to working with you. Um, and thank you for your thoughts on uh, Elise's question. Um, we do have you on the agenda for the NADA meeting on Thursday morning. And so this is the North Area Transportation Alliance. And um, we're gonna be asking some of the same things and really looking to, to get to know you and um, working on uh, uh, trying to figure out what are some next steps, um, especially for the North Area. So thank you so much for being here. Everyone is very excited to get to know you and get to meet you and have a conversation with you and pick your brain a little bit. So thank you so much. Um, it means so much. Have a good one. Thank you for introducing yourself to me. and I look forward to Thursday morning. Right. Yes, go ahead. Uh, also, uh, as everyone, we're delighted to have you here and appreciate you being here at this uh, committee meeting, but also here at RTD. Uh, one of the issues that we, we take very seriously in this committee. I chair the finance committee, and, and one of the things we look at very hard is the issue of equity. And I just wanted to mention that the original agenda that was sent out, it did have a discussion of all of the issues uh, that, that we'd like to bring to the legislature. But there's also a five page document that goes into detail on the equity impacts of all of those changes that are, that are being recommended. And if you get a chance, it would be a really good thing to look through just to get a feel for how seriously we're, we're taking the issue of equity. Thank you very much, Rhett. I am in possession of that document. Good, good. Uh, yes, Dea. Hi, Deborah, I just wanna reintroduce myself. We were on a panel a couple of weeks ago, but uh, my name is Dea Zoll, and I'm also um, very enthusiastic that you are a part of this team. And I also just wanna point out um, one of the comments that you made certainly resonated with the operations subcommittee, which is certainly focused on identifying what is that primary goal that we're trying to accomplish as RTD um, and focusing on really the, the customer, the user experience as they're engaging with RTD system from fares and passes. So I just want to acknowledge and appreciate that comment. Um, and we certainly look forward to working more closely with you. Thank you very much, Day. I appreciate it. Thanks for that great panel. Uh, was that two weeks ago? Elise, did I see your hand up? Yeah. Yeah, I don't want to monopolize, but I wanted to give Deborah an opportunity to flag any issues that you would like the Accountability Committee to focus on. We, as you probably know, will exist to July of next year. So the report that we're submitting in January is just an interim um, start to the conversation. And so we have um, time and intention to die and to delve deeply into um, a whole range of issues, but where would you focus our attention just from, I know you've only been on the job a month, but if there's <laughs> issues and questions that have come up to you, 
for you that you think we should spend some time and love to hear that. Thank you very much, Elise, and thanks for acknowledging I've been here for 30 days because I'm actually doing due diligence uh, assessments right now and listening sessions, and I've met with some of you all. I've met with uh, board members, a board member elect, uh, senior leadership team, employees throughout the organization, as well as our union partners. Um, so I have some ideas, but I don't want to misspeak in my introductory period. But one thing I will say for certain, and it's often a challenging discussion because we all want what we want when we want it. It's looking at our routes from a holistic fashion, and it goes back to my previous comment, and discerning what it is that we need most. Because we have some routes, and I know it's often hard when you're living in a certain area, and it may not be a high-performing route. And we may have a bus come, you know, for argument's sake, every 15 minutes. Would it be in our best interest as we optimize efficiencies, perhaps, to have that bus come every 20 minutes or have every 30 minutes? And sure, there'll take a lot of planning in and around that. But basically, when we're optimizing those dollars, and we can do what I said before, interlining, maybe you have to transfer more than once. But basically, you can have more robust service as opposed to having a one-seat ride. And so as we talk about these things, they're going to be difficult decisions and they're going to be trade-offs because oftentimes you got to give a little to get a little back. But those are the types of things I'm talking about from a service planning vantage point that may yield better service whereby somebody's saying, I went out to the bus stop and my bus didn't show up. And it, and it goes back to the outset of uh, the, my comments that I made in relationship to looking at the schedule first and foremost, because when you start with the schedule, then you map out everything else, how many vehicles needed, how many operators, and it just goes down the line. So that's something I think that is really paramount to the discussion as opposed to saying, oh my God, there's this activity center. And I think you know this will be great because we know we're gonna have people frequenting that place, whether it is a, uh, you know, uh, a higher uh, learning institution, be it a shopping area, be it a, a housing development, we really have to take a step back and look at the projected ridership in reference to what we foresee that foot traffic being and make informed decisions as we look at scheduling as opposed to anecdotal information that we may be getting from a small population. So that's something that I have found in my experience has always yielded you know, some great discomfort, especially, um, and I say this with all due respect, with elected officials trying to ensure they're getting the most for their constituents. And oftentimes it could be a one-off when we can, you know, we, we oftentimes may get a little, um, our judgment may be a little clouded. So that's what I would offer up as being critically important to this endeavor here. Thank you. Thanks for that. And I would just, uh, you should consider this a standing invitation to um, bring issues to us and also come visit with us and react to the work that we're doing and uh, share ideas. Awesome. I have these meetings on my calendar now as I was sharing with Director Geisinger, so I think I'm good to go. So I'll, I'll be coming. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other committee questions? Dan. Thank you, Deborah. My name is Dan Blankenship. I'm the CEO of the Roaring Ford Transportation Authority over on the Western Slope. Uh, you've got a big job and uh, I wish you, wish you well. I was wondering if you could give the committee just a bit of an overview of how COVID-19 is impacting uh, RTD right now and uh, the extent to which you, you feel my, it might be disrupting or, or distracting your ability to plan a little bit more long term? Thank you very much, Dan. Pleasure to meet you and thank you for that very insightful question. I think with COVID-19, with anything, um, this has really enabled us to test ourselves um, in reference to us being flexible and agile. But more specifically, as you all know, RTD was having some troubles pre-COVID as it related to um, ensuring we had appropriate operators to meet those runs that we had. Holistically, it goes back to what I talked about before about our service levels. And oftentimes, it's hard to, you know, to push back and say, we don't have ample amount of operators to do this, that, and the other. Well, with that as a backdrop, with the advent of COVID, um, quite naturally with business stuttering and people now working remotely, um, our ridership, basically has um, dropped off significantly. 
we are currently preparing for what we call a service change taking place in January, whereby we'll be providing 60% of our service delivery model uh, in comparison to what we did in uh, March prior to COVID. So with that as a backdrop, you can imagine that revenues in reference to our fare box has been less than what we anticipated when we projected things going forward at the time we were developing the budget for 2020 back in 2019. Um, as we look at people's comfort levels, and let me qualify this statement by saying that there has been no known instance whereby public transport has been known to be a super spreader of COVID-19. However, people still have their ideas, perceptions, and attitudes as it relates to the convergence amongst people in a common area. So with that as the backdrop, we have to ensure that we're doing, doing our due diligence to create an atmosphere whereby people can be comfortable. And it's very challenging in its own right because here we have you know, CDC guidelines and public health orders saying that folks need to social distance. Well, that onus is placed on the operator for all intents and purposes who is a franchisee out there with his own mobile store and basically having to be all things to all people as, it, as we talk about regulation and, and so forth and adherence to those guidelines. So I bring that up to say that while we may have a standard 40 foot bus out there in service, basically we're capping that capacity at 15, whereby we may be using an articulated vehicle, which is 60 feet, we're capping that at 20. So what we're doing to ensure that we're moving people to and fro is that we're having to put more vehicles out with less resources to ensure we're creating an environment which can be viewed as being you know, safe and healthy for those that are trying to get around via public transport. So it's making difficult decisions as we look at what is actually happening there. So um, as we go forward, what we're doing is, as I said, in January, we are having a service reduction and I'll speak to the elephant in the room. Quite naturally, we've had to reduce our workforce levels to meet that of our budgetary vantage point in relationship to delivering that service. So we are having a reduction in force. Um, we basically received money through the coronavirus aid and relief um, efficiency act uh, which is known as cares and that money will be fully expended at the end of uh, this month and so recognizing that there has been talk you know at the federal level of trying to get a bipartisan support as it relates to a relief bill uh, there is yet to be anything that's brought forward at this juncture we remain optimally, optimistically hopeful that something will come to fruition and we're trying to make those decisions going forward. But getting back to Dan, your more specific question, as we march down this path, it's basically looking at what it is we know to be our transit ridership and making adjustments as we go forward. Um, while we're providing service at 60% of our pre-COVID schedule, we only have 40% ridership, so we do have room as relates to that growth aspect. Working in tandem with members of my operations team, we have looked at a recovery plan, utilizing models whereby we could quickly pivot because while we have made uh, some adjustments as relates to the operator availability, we still do have what we call people on extra board. It's very analogous to having a substitute teacher that you can call in. So if in fact we need to pivot, we could do so. But more specifically, I'll be very transparent in, in, in reference to having some concerns if the vaccine came full circle and here we are in the summer and we're ready to go and we're out of place. I have concerns how quickly we can pivot due to the fact that we have to ensure our operators are operating at a high level of care. And if we've had them out of the workforce, we still will have to take them back to a training process. And so that's where I have some angst in relationship to that because if they're out for 30 days, that'll be a lot easier as opposed to them being out for two months. And that will cause some angst as relates to getting people geared up, going over requirements as relates to possessing that CDL and ensuring that they know what they should know as relates to operating uh, with a high level of care. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, yes, very well, thank you. Uh, it sounds like you have have your hands full and again I, I just wish you the very best thank you very much dan nice meeting you and i appreciate your kind remarks kathy uh go ahead and uh we are running out of time i i want to be able to move us through the agenda so i'm going to 
cut us off after Ka uh, Kathy is able to um, share her comments. I am. Um, don't have any questions. I just want to say you are off to a wonderful start, Ms. Johnson. I'm happy that you are in the role that you are and anything that I can do um, personally to get you acclimated to the city. I know you're so busy. Um, I am happy to do so. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is very generous and thoughtful of you. And hey, I most definitely will take you up on it. <laughs> thank you. I'll take you for coffee when we get a chance. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. Uh, thank you again, Deborah, for, for joining us and for giving us your very candid, um, honest thoughts. Uh, we very much appreciate it. And I know that that's going to help guide our work. As you know, we're an independent uh, accountability body, but you know, it's a, it's a dance we have to do. Uh, we, although we are independent, we do want to make sure that our recommendations are feasible and that they um, have input from subject matter experts. So, you know, it is a back and forth and we may not always agree, but I know we um, take your comments and guidance um, with a lot of, um, uh, you know, consideration given your experience um, and our ability to um, translate these recommendations into real, um, you know, trans transformative changes uh, for RTD. So thank you once again for, for joining us. All righty, uh, let me pull up my agenda. Okay, um, now that we've heard from our, the CEO and general manager of RTD, we're going to uh, transition into subcommittee reports. And we're gonna start off with our finance subcommittee. Rhett? Uh, you're on mute. <laughs> there we go, I'll, I'll try to be very brief. Um, we, we have uh, taken a look at the adopted RTD budget and we had a, a very comprehensive uh, discussion and report on that. Uh, we, we're, we are continuing to look at peer agency pass, uh, passes, just informative. We have another committee, uh, operations that's doing a lot of work on that. Uh, and we've looked at consultant services and using the, our consulting services uh, to uh, basically look at how other agencies are operating, to look at what we've done uh, with the CARES money and to get them to provide independent uh, opinions about that. We've also had these discussions about a role that RTD could play in, uh, in helping, especially when we get to the point in our vaccination programs of mass vaccinations. And RTD has a lot of resources there uh, from parking uh, to transportation to, to uh, people that could potentially uh, play a role in that. And so uh, I've had meetings and discussions with, with different agencies from the governor's office to the uh, CDPHE group and uh, gotten input and also met with some RTD people to discuss what some of those opportunities could be. So uh, uh, finally, we you know, we had a set of goals and objectives that came from the legislature and that came from the governor. And so we've, we've gone through a review of all of those and, and are developing a strategy for how we get to the ones we haven't gotten to yet. But there may be some of those we may be able to and may be prepared to report out on now. So that's it. Thank you. Um, can we hear from the governance subcommittee? Yes. All right, so for our last meeting, we actually had a presentation from Doug um, regarding the um, community-based planning, transit planning, and so that was a good discussion. We're continuing to go down this route of um, determining what something like this would look like um, from uh, moving from uh, the, the current RTD model to incorporating these service councils, if you will, of, of smaller communities coming together um, or, or smaller segments of the district coming together to talk about um, community-based uh, transit planning. And so we, we continued that conversation on our last meeting. We also had another robust conversation about governance structure and really talking about how do we move forward in evaluating uh, 
the, the actual makeup of representation. Currently, we have an elected board um, that's 15 members. Is that going to be the best way moving forward? Um, folks uh, wanted to explore or at least start the conversation about what would appointed seats look like, um, what would different um, district sizes look like, things like that. And so um, a lot of it was still just kind of flushing out uh, the priorities in that conversation. But moving forward, we're going to reach out to technical staff that have already been on a lot of our calls and working on flushing out more discussion and details around the service councils and the community-based transportation planning. So in, in a nutshell, that's the way our conversations have been going over the past month. Uh, thank you, Julie. I know uh, just to elevate the, you know, um, conversation, the, the tricky conversation around changing uh, governance structures. I just wanted to thank you for chairing this particular subcommittee and for uh, delving into a maybe a very uncomfortable conversation, but I think a really honest one and a very necessary one, really, all of, all of our conversations. With, um, yeah. yeah, and I think that's our goal. We really just want to have the discussion. That's what we're here to do is um, bring up issues that you know we've heard from our districts what we've heard from other leaders in the community and um let's flush out some of those conversations and and have them even if they are a little tricky so we'll do our best thanks julie all righty daya do you want to talk about the operations subcommittee sure so at our last operations subcommittee we um heard from steven higashida with the transit center um, I think as, as was mentioned a little bit earlier by Rhett's comments, uh, the operations committee has really been focused on the fare and pass structures. Um, and so during the presentation, um, we heard a couple of fare framework, um, so F-A-R-E framework recommendations that the transit center has offered um, for us as a committee to consider. One is that fare policy should be guided by goals um, to allude to some of the comments that Deborah uh, Johnson reflected earlier. Um, fare box recovery is a metric, not necessarily a goal. So really shifting how we how we might approach our um, work moving forward as a subcommittee. And then that fare should be easy to understand um, and easy to pay. So really speaking to that um, user customer experience and folks that actually rely on transit. Um, we, as part of the presentation, learned a little bit more about um, three different agencies' goals uh, when it comes to fare policy. So MTA in San Francisco, TriMet, and then King County. Um, as far as our next steps, we have kind of taken the conversation and are starting to uh, focus in on what we may offer as some suggested policy um, goals as a subcommittee um, that we would then offer to the RTD board. A couple um, that we're just kind of playing around with that are not solid, um, but I've heard several times mentioned within the within the subcommittee are user slash customer focused fare and past structures that are easy to understand. Um, fares that improve and promote operational efficiency. So how does service ultimately connect back to the fare structure and how are we ensuring that we're able to do it in an efficient and effective way? And then um, understanding what that sub-regional regional, regional um, fare structure looks like and just being really crystal clear about that. So. Our next steps um, at the next meeting, we'll dive into the, the proposed draft goals and start to formulate what our um, what our potential recommendations are, um, but also making sure that we're operationalizing what's happening within the finance and the governance subcommittee as it ultimately rolls out um, on the ground. So that is our report. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you um, to our three subcommittee chairs. Again, uh, lots of work, lots of great uh, progress. And at this time, I want to hand it over to my esteemed co-chair to kick off the next part of our agenda. Elise. Thanks, Crystal. Appreciate that. So the next item is our legislative recommendations. We've actually talked quite a bit about um, some of these changes in various subcommittees, but we wanted to um, just vet it one final time uh, to the full committee to get um, buy-in and sign-off from the full body. I will say that a draft version of these, um, the current version, but a draft was forwarded 
um, to uh, State Transportation Committee lawmakers, Faith Winter and Matt Gray at their request, just so they could get a sense of where we are headed and start some legislative planning because as you know, the, the new session is gonna be starting soon and you can't wait to the last minute to be coming up with bill ideas. Um, they had indicated, uh, we had relayed um, RTD's concern about sort of a, a open-ended Pandora box sort of bill that could lead to other um, changes that maybe wouldn't be as helpful to RTD and got their um, agreement easily um, and focus to look at running an early and narrow bill that just addressed these types of changes and wasn't broader, so would have a, a narrow bill title. So that's their current thinking. Um, you know, we're at the early stages of this, so we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves, but we wanted to sign off um, from the committee on the legislative package that we would actually include in our interim report in early January. So with that, I think, um, was Ron going to go over um, the legislative proposals in any detail? I saw his name attached to the agenda item. There he is. Hi, Co-Chair Jones. Good morning, everyone. Ron Papsdorf here from Dr. Cog. I, I don't think I need to spend a lot of time going over this. The um, draft legislative proposal is in the agenda packet um, in um, agenda item number six. And um, as has previously been mentioned, there are four key components um, included in this legislate in the recommendations um, that uh, in front of the committee today. Um, one that um, eliminates um, a fair box recovery ratio uh, requirement that's currently in statute for RTD, um, uh, allowing a bit more flexibility for RTD. Um, Transitorian development and other development at its properties around transit stations um, and light rail stations, uh, more flexibility for RTD and how it manages parking on its property and at its stations, and then um, uh, additional clarity on um, how RTD can contract for services uh, with outside providers. Um, I think the intent as these have been crafted has been to um, allow RTD additional flexibility in how it provides services to make sure that it can focus on its highest priorities, uh, principally um, increasing ridership and providing equitable service within its service territory. Um, and then uh, finally, I would note that um, uh, working with members of the committee, um, we, and I, I use the term we loosely, Matthew Helfant, uh, primarily uh, with input from the committee members authored uh, an equity assessment for these proposals uh, in front of the committee. Um, and I will um, ask Matthew to briefly go over the equity assessment results uh, that were sent out as an addendum to the agenda packet on Friday afternoon. So hopefully everyone had a chance to, to review that uh, prior to this morning, but I'll have Matthew summarize that for the committee. Uh, this is a formal recommendation, so uh, this is an item in front of the committee asking for uh, formal approval of these recommendations as part of its preliminary work. Uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions for me. Otherwise, I can hand off to, to Matthew to speak to the equity assessment of the proposal. Rebecca? Just a note, I thought that the paper was really well done. So thank you to whoever worked on that. It was very... Uh, easy to follow and, and uh, well-written, so thanks. Are you referring to the equity assessment or the legislative piece or both? Sorry, the legislative piece, yeah. Excellent. Well, hats off to Rutt who did some work on that and uh, um, did a deep dive, so appreciate that. Uh, yeah. uh, Matthew, do you wanna give just a brief summary of the equity assessment? I, I do think everybody had a chance to read it and also um, that has drawn a lot of kudos, rightfully so, for the quick turnaround and the really comprehensive nature that that group um, did on equity. And I understand um, your write-up assisted greatly with that as well. So you're muted. You're muted, Matthew. <laughs> Let's 
Matthew Helfant, uh, a senior transportation planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, Got to give credit to the, the uh, members of the committee that uh, put together the, um, the, the, uh, the assessment uh, 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 to, to begin with that I used as a template to, to, to make uh, this assessment. So um, all, of, all, of the, um, all of the questions that, uh, that were uh, uh, crafted by, by that subgroup of the committee were what I used uh, to create the draft of, of this document. So just looked uh, with uh, uh, many of the committee members earlier uh, last week, uh, we went through each of the legislative proposals and um, tried to think through uh, any uh, impacts uh, to um, vulnerable populations that could potentially happen as a result, and then just put it through uh, the um, the template that the subgroup of the committee had put together um, several months ago now. Um, and that's about it. Happy to take any questions if there are any. Any questions for Matthew? Um, Crystal. Yeah, I, well, I, you know, I think my question actually is a little more broad, but we have both the equity assessment document that Matt helped create um, as well as the document with the specific legislative recommendations. Um, it, you know, and there was some quick turnaround, we'd have some discussion, but if, if the committee members want, you know, any last minute input, do we have a time frame of when uh, we're gonna final, you know, like a soft final, um, you know, none of this is final until our final report, but a soft final report to um, share. Um, is there a, a deadline there? I know that the, 73rd legislative um, session starts on January 13th. So, you know, we were trying to align that with the start of session. Um, do we have any other dates that we might consider for feedback? I think, oh, sorry, Coach Eric Jones, please. Well, I was just going to say our next meeting is January 11th, and um, we had talked about making that the uh, meeting where we sort of officially signed off on our interim report and sent it on its way to the governor and to RGD and the lawmakers. Um, so that would be sort of the final drop dead on any changes to the interim report. I think we were hoping to, to get the blessing today on the legislative component um, so that, that uh, A, we could communicate that to, the, to um, Faith and Matt ahead of time that we didn't have any changes that, that the recommendations um, that, you know, if they need to start working on legislation, they can go ahead and do that. Um, but certainly if there are line edits or, you know, word changes that people want, particularly in the equity assessment, I don't know that we have to have that before January 11th. Ron, what were you going to add to that? Um, what Co-Chair Jones said. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay, perfect. Yes, I just wanted to call that out for anyone who is interested in um, re-reviewing. I know we might have some downtime during this um, holiday season. So again, our goal is, as chairs is to facilitate as much input um, from this committee and dialogue. And, you know, that's all being said with a caveat that this has been discussed extensively over, you know, several meetings. But again, just that uh, last opportunity before we send that off. But uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if we see any substantive changes, but just making sure that our committee members feel that they have um, the ability to have input um, before this this is, you know, you know, official. Um, thank you. So, given that, maybe I, I think it would be great today if we could get a, a motion and and approval of the legislative um, proposal. And at least the the gist of the equity assessment, um, leaving open any final line edits to the equity assessment, because we really haven't had as much time with that document. If people wanted to fine tune it, um, I, I think that that would be appropriate today. And assuming you agree, Crystal and committee members, I'm not seeing any vigorous. Yeah, that makes uh, sense to me. And I think that that's a good way to move forward. All right, so Rhett, hopefully you're raising your hands to put a motion on the table because you I would am, certainly am. be appropriate to do that. I'd like to move that after all the work that everyone has put into this legislative proposal, 
that we approve it and uh, and pass it along to the legislature, specifically Matt and Faith. And do we have a second? I'll second, I'll second. <laughs> Everybody seconds. All right. Well, All right. Um, we have um, any further discussion? All right. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Looks unanimous. Wonderful. And I see Chris is with us. Wonderful, too. Yeah, I've been here. I've just been hiding. That's all right. I some I sometimes have days where I don't need to turn on my video as well. <laughs> okay. Well, with that, I'm going to just keep us moving along because we have a couple other really important things to discuss. Um, one is the preliminary report outline. I think Doug's going to talk about that to set us up for um, finalizing our interim report by the January meeting. Doug, do you want to talk about that? Great. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. And I, first, I would also like to express my appreciation for Deborah being on the call today. And the few conversations that we have had, I've really enjoyed, and I, I look forward to working with Deborah. And in my day job as uh, Executive Director of Dr. Cog, and we've had a tremendous partnership through the years with RTD, and, and I know that's only going to continue. And Deborah, I don't know if you've looked at your calendar yet, but you're you're going <laughs> to give some initial thoughts to the board on uh, Wednesday evening. <laughs> Um, also, it's also, that will be Director Jones's last Dr. Cog meeting. I'm still trying to come to grips with that because Elise has been, she's all I've ever known about Dr. Cog, so I don't even like talking about it. <laughs> I'm a nightmare that haunts you, I see. No, you are not. I'm going to miss you greatly. Um, so as, as Co-Chair Jones did mention, um, uh, the RTD Accountability Committee does have the option of providing a preliminary report. Um, and um, and you know, in discussions with the co-chairs as well as the chairs of the subcommittees, um, we are really um, striving to have a report available for your review and consideration at the January 11th meeting, as the co-chair mentioned. If there are those on the call that feel strongly that we don't want to do a preliminary report, please let us know before we get too far down the road, staff. Um, but I think there's, there's, uh, there's broad support for that. Um, we do have for um, you know a draft outline for you all, and like most outlines, probably it's, it seems a little top heavy with a lot of the kind of background information. But just just know that um, the focus of the report will indeed be um, really six and seven. Um, primarily, I kind of like this terminology called investigations, kind of the summary of things that the the subcommittees and the full committee are are um, are currently. Um, have taken on and um, so we'll really focus in that area as well as of course we'll have the uh, um, the uh, legislative recommendations were just approved in the report as well I'm really at this time I want to just check with everybody in anybody to see if there's you know a specific area we should set the highest priority in, on or if there's something that just seems totally missing from this outline but if not um, Staff, we're planning on uh, really getting going with this over the next couple of weeks and, and have something available for you to review um, a week in advance of our next meeting. And just so you all know, I will say this also, uh, Co-Chair Jones, that um, we'll, throughout the next couple of weeks, as we begin to, you know, kind of piece this all together, we'll be working with the co-chairs as well as the chairs of the subcommittee so, so that they can have uh, an opportunity to review and comment and come up with a... Uh, with a product which they're happy with that they're willing to share with the full board. Thank you. Doug, I might add that um, I think, you know, the, as you mentioned, the key is really six and seven. And I think um, there's probably three categories <coughs> of substance there. One is things where we are actually making our official recommendations like the legislative proposal. Second are areas where we're not quite complete with our recommendations, but we're headed down a path and we can talk sort of in general terms about where we're headed. For example, um, that, you know, the, the fares and passes sort of generally uh, what we can almost forecast where the types of recommendations are going to be. And then there's sort of a, 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 an ongoing to-do list of things that we intend to look at that we really haven't started too much. And so sort of the next layer of investigation in the finance committee, for example. So I think, um, 
I think it would be useful to to be able to um, understand the differences between those as you're reading the report, because I don't, I th I think we have done a lot of work and we want to be able to um, share that with everyone, but also to um, in particular, the middle category where we're not quite done with recommendations, but we have laid the groundwork. I want to be able to sort of forecast where we're headed. Um, and that perhaps will uh, enable more public involvement and feedback, which I think we, we definitely want. Oh, that's helpful. Thank you very much. Other thoughts, concerns, questions about um, where we're headed with the interim report? Elise, this is Jaya. I just want to be really clear that the equity assessment will be within the initial legislative recommendations. Is that right? Absolutely. Okay, great. I just want to make sure that's showing up in here as well. And I would think that um, that's a that's a good point. That Doug, we want to have perhaps some appendices like the yes. the equity framework that that we. Um, had adopted that that applies to all of our recommendations should be a standalone sort of document at the end as well as the equity assessment attached directly to the legislative recommendations definitely yes and I, I I think one of the the things that you know the subcommittees are still doing work in December and the interim report should reflect the you know, as up to date as possible as we can with the work as far as it's gotten, I think, if that makes sense. So I think it will be, the onus will be on the subcommittees to be able to communicate um, how far how far they are, are and what they feel comfortable being public about in terms of where they're headed, if that makes sense. Other thoughts, comments? I, I want to um, just see if our RTD board members have any um, thing to add, any questions or concerns. We are scheduled, I think Crystal and I maybe, and, and, and Dr. Cog's staff are scheduled to make a report and check in with a full RTD board at their January meeting, I think. That may actually happen after we finalize the the report. So, just want to open up the conversation for you all to join in and and talk to us about how you're feeling about things. Great, thanks, Elise. Um, uh, yeah, I was just looking at it, and I'm guessing that you're scheduled on the 12th, so it is the day after. But uh, I think that will be very helpful to come in. I, um, uh, and I'm take, taking notes here just to make sure. I don't know if the uh, you know if our equity team that does all the you know the required FTA equity analysis has seen this equity analysis. Um, do you know Matthew? Not sure. Um, um, so I we uh, we just did the equity analysis of the legislative um, proposal. Um, and sent it to committee members. It was um, uh, to, to, for review and then uh, earlier last week, and then it was sent late on Friday uh, uh, as an addendum um, to everybody. So uh, there hasn't been um, sufficient time for it to, to fully flow, I guess, uh, and haven't had any specific conversations with anybody about it. Great. Well, it's you know it's um, it's Deborah's thing. I'm just writing notes of things we should follow up on. But um, I assume that we'll want our equity team to you know just make sure it's complying with the, with what we're required to do. And and uh, other than that, I don't really have a lot of comment today. I'm taking some notes of things to to follow up on um, in the next next week or two. Thanks. Great, Len. Troy, did you have anything to add? Not really. Thank you. Uh... For the opportunity, though, uh, Madam Co-Chair, I'll uh, definitely work with Lynn on my uh, the merger of our notes. Uh, but we've got Deborah on the call, so uh, I'm sure she's got it handled. But appreciate the uh, opportunity. Thanks. All right. 
Last call for any comments on where we're headed with the interim report. I guess I have one question for Doug while you all are formulating any final thoughts, and that is when should committee members expect a draft so that we can um, have an opportunity to read it and um, and be prepared to provide input before the January 11th meeting? Yeah, um, so we're looking at probably the that Monday the 4th, so we'll get it out to you guys a week in advance. Um, if we can, if we get it finished sooner than that, of course, we can send it, but um, it's further complicated, of course, because of the holidays and everything, but um, we're looking a week in advance. But we will provide um, at least bits and pieces to the the chairs of the subcommittees and co-chairs as we, as we kind of build this thing out over the next couple of weeks. And I don't know if it's helpful that it seems like the, you know, items one through five and item seven are probably things that can be written now. And then mm -hmm. it's really five and six that are going to be, well, even six is really the, the part that's particularly fluid. So if yeah. it's helpful to write it in pieces. Um, oh, definitely. So, okay. Any final other comments? I want to move to the last agenda item. I'm not seeing any. So the last agenda item is the CARES Act discussion. And I believe Matt Matthew is going to um, <coughs> cue that up. Yes, uh, good morning again. Um, so uh, the CARES Act was passed by Congress and signed into law in late March of this year. It's, uh, it's over $2 trillion of economic relief. Uh, which also included uh, $25 billion in direct relief for transit agencies, of which RTD, re RTD received approximately $232 million. And one of, the, one of the charges of this committee is to um, look into RTD's uh, expending of those funds. Uh, the committee has um, contracted with North Highland uh, consulting uh, and North Highland was uh, staff was um, asked to take a look and uh, they have um, they have a brief report to provide. Great, thank you, Matthew. Um, just quick logistics here, Matthew. Um, we do have some slides prepared, but I notice I don't have a screen share option. Um, can we distribute these slides following the meeting today? We can. We can make you a presenter, Tanya. Oh, fantastic! Thank you, Melinda. No problem. Can you all see my screen? Yes, we can. Oh, fantastic. Okay, let me head back here then. And move this. Oh, I see what's happening. <laughs> Sorry, I apologize. All right. One last time. Almost there. I apologize. Here we go. All right. Well, first, I want to thank the committee um, for having us today. Um, we're happy to share our findings um, of the CARES Act analysis um, as. Uh, Matthew mentioned and Ms., uh, Mr. Bridges mentioned, we were asked to take a look at um, you know, the CARES Act spending and, and provide some sort of forward-looking um, ideas of what RTD might be able to think about moving forward. Um, so we'll start with brief introductions um, and uh, of our team, go over our approach to the work here, what our findings were, and again, that look forward. Um, and we'll pause then for uh, any questions that you all may have. So on the line and joining us today uh, is Anna Daniger, Daniger uh, who uh, the committee, I believe you all have met uh, both Anna and I before. However, uh, Mrs. Johnson, this, is, this will be the first time you've met us. So pleased to meet you. We're also joined today by Derek Pender. He's a, a member of the North Highland Transportation Team. And he actually executed a good deal of this work. Um, so he's got some specific experience in workforce planning um, within tr uh, transportation and finance. Um, so he's actually gonna be walking us through um, the approach and findings. So Derek, if I could turn it over to you. 
Thank you so much. Can you all hear me? Perfect. Uh, so, as mentioned by both Tanya and Matthew, we were asked to take a look at CARES Act spending review, uh, conduct a CARES Act spending review. This included three specific requests. Um, one, you know, this overall high level review uh, of, of uh, the use of stimulus funds, including our overall approach uh, leverage for analysis and research. Second, a summary of how findings were utilized. And third, supplemental materials provided um, that we utilized to, uh, to conduct our analysis. Um, in addition to that, as Tanya mentioned, we provided some additional insights on, on uh, guidance for RTD moving forward. So um, with that in mind, our, our four-step approach included the following uh, on the next slide, Tanya. Um, so our overall approach, um, we took a look at four pieces. Um, first, uh, a discovery phase where we requested financial documentation from RTD on how that information was, how the funding was spent. Uh, second, conducting some external research on um, how FDA intended for that funding to be spended, making sure that we align that in our review phase. Um, then in our review phase, uh, take a look at how that, that, again, aligned with the FDA mandate and develop questions for uh, a, a conversation with Doug McLeod, uh, acting CFO and controller, uh, to, to validate some of our, our findings. Um, third, in that validation phase, we had a conversation with, with Doug to kick the tires a little bit on A, our initial findings uh, based on our analysis of, of the financial data, and also um, further understand rationale, how we went about, uh, how RTD went about um, spending that CARES funding. Um, and uh, also additional, uh, subsequent actions that were taken uh, in regards to um, additional cost cutting measures. Um, and then finally, we summarized our findings in a report that will be provided to the committee as well as this, uh, this overall presentation today. So um, on our next slide, we will walk through the, the three high level findings. So um, summary findings for you all, first and foremost, um, use of the CARES Act funding appears to be spent in alignment with the overall FTA mandate. Um, our second finding, uh, in terms of how that, that funding was utilized um, and, and the overall rationale for utilizing that funding, um, both balancing the, the uh, availability of transportation options, maintaining service, um, as well as the RTD perception of a responsibility to its workforce and the overall region as a major employer within the region. And third, um, you know, in, in addition to uh, how this money was utilized, we kicked the tires a little bit on the various cost-cutting measures employed by RTD outside of uh, the use of CARES Act funding. So that's the high-level view of, of, of our findings. We'll go into each finding in detail. Um, so first finding, uh, how that, that CARES Act funding was utilized. Um, CARES funding was spent in two areas. So one, uh, two-thirds of it was spent uh, in terms of represented and unrepresented salary, wages, and benefits. Um, for both unionized and non-unionized employees. Um, and then about a third of that was then spent, at, spent on purchase transportation. And these are uh, contracted services for um, externally contracted routes with Denver Transportation Partners. Um, at the time of our review, 208 million of the 232 million of funding had been drawn. Um, and as uh, Deborah mentioned this morning, the additional 24 million is earmarked for use by the end of 2020. Um, so that was our, our first finding. Um, our second finding goes into a little bit of detail on the overall rationale. Uh, if we could advance our slide there, Tanya. Um, so in terms of how uh, the, the overall mindset for utilizing this funding um, was, was to maintain both service and, uh, and operations um, based on four different areas that we saw were, were influenced there. So first, an overall perception of responsibilities for the, the region. RTD is a major employer within the region. Um, the view that if, if one domino falls, others fall with it. Um, so maintaining operations and maintaining the workforce uh, it, with that overall view of the responsibility to the region. Um, the second and third items, loss of in-demand roles and loss of roles with high acquisition costs. Um, pursuing a reduction in force uh, actually could have had detrimental financial impacts downstream if the, uh, if the pandemic was, was shorter and the, the impact of this was shorter. So for instance, Certain roles, such as uh, maintenance and repair roles, are, are already in such high demand that offboarding some of those roles earlier on in the pandemic, if it was shorter, um, would have had a, a financial impact in terms of, uh, we already have folks that, that we're seeing are, are experiencing mandatory overtime due to the, the lack of, of folks in those roles. And additionally, operators, um, the, the high acquisition costs for operators 
Um, it costs about 20,000 at least to, to train operators to be in those, those seats. So um, getting rid of some of those, those roles earlier on in the pandemic would have actually had a, a detrimental financial impact from that. And then the, third, the, the fourth and final piece that, that impacted um, the, the overall decision-making process was obviously to maintain compliance with the overall collective bargaining agreement, um, moving in a, a premature or hasty fashion towards um, any workforce changes obviously needs to take into account the collective bargaining agreement that, that exists for unionized employees. Um, so with all these four pieces in, in alignment, um, it led to the, the, the decision and rationale behind maintaining operations and maintaining, maintaining the existing workforce. Um, our third and final finding, um, outside of that, it does not mean that RTD did not pursue other options for uh, ensuring the financial viability of RTD. Um, so we, we did know in our conversations with, with Mr. McLeod and, and other folks um, that other cost-cutting measures were enacted by RTD to support overall financial viability. This included the suspension of, of a variety of discretionary spending measures, such as um, non-FTA required training, um, looking at salary cuts and furloughs for non-unionized employees, um, administering a hiring freeze where you know it, it took the C-suite level to to approve other uh, other new hires, um, service cuts as we mentioned today, obviously with capacity down, service cuts were were taken as a result of that, and a hold on all capital construction initiatives, um, previously budgeted capital construction initiatives such as resurfacing parking lots and other initiatives like that. Um, to maintain and, and, and really ensure the financial viability of RTD going forward. So those were our, our, our three major findings. I'll hand it back over to Tanya to, to speak a little bit to, to looking forward and some additional considerations for RTD. Thanks, Derek. Um, yeah, so looking forward and considering um, possible additional federal funding that could aid organizations impacted by COVID, there are opportunities that exist for RTD to sustain operations. And many of these things echo the themes that you heard from Ms. Johnson earlier. Um, so first, um, you know, seek to maintain operations for the region and those served by RTD. So you know, it's not unusual for public transit agencies to find themselves balancing equity and equality um, when determining uh, service needs. So in times like these, vulnerable populations and essential workers need access to public transportation more than ever. Um, so pursuing options that maintain operations for particular areas, uh, geographic areas, populations, or, or specific routes will continue um, RTD service to the community and its employees. Also, RTD can continue to analyze service needs. Um, so, you know, it's expected that transit ridership will continue to fluctuate as public and private organizations respond to the pandemic. And, begin looking at returning to work and what new, new ways of working look like. So maintaining routes that are not being utilized will adversely impact both revenue and margins um, as a result of more stringent sanitation procedures and lost revenue. So continuing to analyze uh, these service needs will allow RTD to kind of right size as the re region returns to a new normal. Another uh, opportunity for RTD co to consider is the prioritization of more adaptable route systems. So fixed route systems such as rail um, offer limited flexibility and lower responsiveness to service changes. Um, so some of these, these rail um, routes are maintaining relatively healthy ridership, relatively speaking, right? So um, for example, the A-line, However, others, not so much. So um, there's also the added requirement of social distancing um, that, that requires some additional vehicles, um, which RTD is calling loop extras. These are vehicles that are added to a route to provide overflow coverage. So prioritizing these bus routes will allow RTD to respond to um, needs, changing needs more readily than, than rail service will. Also, ensuring that cuts are logical and sustainable. So, um, you know, in terms of personnel cutoff or personnel cuts, um, you know, it is important to note that RTD is a major employer in the Denver region. So, any layoffs can have a notable effect on the economy, as Derek mentioned. They also come with significant costs of rehiring trained staff, as Ms. Johnson mentioned. Um, or in the case of uh, you know, hiring new staff, the, the cost of recruiting, hiring, and training these new employees is rather substantial. 
So any custom personnel should bear this in mind, and certainly Seams RTD has this in mind, um, you know, so that they can ensure uh, that any reduction in force is logical and sustainable in the long term. And finally, considering the use of lower cost employees in certain roles. So RTD is proactively considering opportunities of reducing the use of higher cost contractors um, with difficult to replace positions. So for example, um, using operators and mechanics to fill conductor type roles um, in place of security firms. This is, these are moves that are similar to other transit agencies. Um, you know, this is not unusual and, and it um, not only reduces the costs for RTD, but it also allows RTD to retain the staff um, that have the skills that are difficult to, to replace or, or, or are replaced at a high cost. So um, RTD does have some opportunities to sustain the service within the region, as well as their, um, as well as understanding what their financial reality is for the next several months. So we'll pause here with any questions you all may have for us. Thanks so much for that um, analysis and the quick summary of it. Really appreciate it. Questions, Brett. So. First, let me say that this really looks like exactly what we wanted to get in, in terms of being able to document how the funds were spent and what the priorities are and what the future might be in that. I find this to be uh, enough detail that we can say that this part of what we've been requested to do from the legislature and the governor in terms of the CARES Act is, is sufficient. My only concern is it, it is a little detailed for what we probably expect that they'll actually read. Uh, and one of the things I'd like to do is get a one-page summary that that avoids any kind of internal terminology or specific RTD terminology so much that you would expect that just the average legislate, legislator reading this could say, yes, there it is. And if I want more detail, I could go to the slideshow. So could we get that, that sort of one pager to, to provide that summary? And if we do, we can get that by our next meeting. I think the finance committee could pass this along as being one of those things that we could say we've accomplished that was on our list of, of uh, actions and, and move on from this. Madam Absolutely. Chair. Great idea, Rut. Sound reasonable? Rebecca? Uh, Dan, you guys sound good with that? Good. And just to put a fine point at Reddit, what I hear you saying is to include the one pager and the the presentation sort of as an appendix um, yeah. in our interim report in January, because exactly. this is one of the specific things we are tasked with. Right. Other comments, questions, concerns? Rebecca, did you? Yep. Oh, sorry. Hi. This is Dana. Um, Tanya, oh. I. Sorry, I'm off video because I'm a little oh. wonky on the internet right now. Um, Tanya, I did have a question around um, what other transit agencies might be doing in terms of that workforce. You know, with RTD potentially letting go workforce that is a high cost um, to to not only re-recruit but also to just retain longer term. Um, is there anything that you've learned or seen in other agencies that we may want to consider um, in our conversations with RTD or, or within our recommendations? Sure, yes. Um, well, unfortunately, layoffs are coming for several agencies, right? Um, uh, Boston, MBTA has re recently announced them, WMATA, those are two that come to mind. Um, so in terms of how they're actually approaching their decision making. Unfortunately, we don't have any um, insight into that. Um, we weren't lucky enough to sit down with a Mr. McLeod, for example, at those agencies uh, to determine that. Um, but but we do know that the um, you know unfortunately this is a reality of, of many transit agencies, um, and and they're often um, you know kind of trying to balance you know what what's best um, for their employees for the region and. Again, the collective bargaining agreements and making sure that they're in adherence to that. 
one thing I can add on there, uh, just Tanya as well, is um, I, I think per our, our looking forward recommendations, um, the opportunities for reskilling and, and where, you know, within obviously the collective bargaining agreement, but the opportunities for reskilling, um, lower cost uh, per that last point that Tanya made, uses of lower cost employees for, for other roles if it's within um, a job description and be a similar functional space is something we've seen a lot of employers do both within you know, outside of the transit space as well. Um, so, so that would be be one space I would would encourage you know a, an additional tire kick if you will. And and one of our priorities was to to demonstrate that uh, that RTD is doing everything they can to get the biggest as as um, CEO Johnson said, bang for the buck for the taxpayers' dollars. And I think from that perspective, it's worth it's worth exploring. And I know you probably already, already are better CEO. So it, it fits with our with our assignment from the legislature from the governor's office. Good point. Any other Comments, questions, yeah. Rebecca? Yeah, I, um, I agree with Rhett. This is sure nice to have this one checked off our to-do list. Um, so I appreciate the, the work by North Highland. You know, I'm, I'm wondering though, if you have any thoughts, and this I think is a little beyond of the scope of what we asked, but you know, it's one thing to, to look at sort of the end of a process, right? The RTD is just about spent all the CARES dollars and look backwards and say, um, they made the right decisions and seem to have the right priorities in mind. But I'm wondering if you had any any thoughts on the transparency of that process and sort of reflecting those priorities as they went into spending these dollars and kind of sharing that through the through the board meetings or other ways so that the the public and other stakeholders um, were brought along on that um, because these dollars are quite precious and Part of the reason I'm asking that is because if we look at RTD perhaps receiving a second round of stimulus dollars with the bill under consideration now, um, could there be more um, transparency, I guess, around how those dollars would be spent earlier in the process? Well, I think that, you know, part, you, you, you speak about earlier in the process and I think part of the part of the issue was nobody really knew how long COVID was going to last, right? You know, there yeah. was this hope that we would stay home for two weeks and this would all be behind us. Um, and so, you know, the short term and the short term and trying to make sure that RTD was prepared to turn around quickly, you know, they certainly they certainly did those right things. And I think it's, you know, a, a little bit challenging now to look back and say, you know, um, with, with what we know now, could we have done much different? Probably not. But then again, looking forward, here are those sort of those five opportunities um, that we have moving forward with additional funding um, com coming along, hopefully. There also, I would add, there also wasn't a great deal of flexibility either. Um, so you know, the FTA was very um, uh, yeah. direct in how those dollars could be spent. But I think it is a good point that we de definitely have a sense of COVID now. Certainly not a the the crystal ball is a little murky on when when the vaccine will roll out and that kind of thing. But um, should there be a second tranche, I think there will be an opportunity to to think more deeply, particularly about how we communicate or how mm -hmm. RTD communicates. So. I'm noticing that it's 10 o'clock and I have a hard stop and I apologize for cutting this a little close in my management. I don't know if there are other questions that people had. Um, if so, maybe we can submit them in writing and, and get them answered. Um, I have to jump off really quickly. Crystal, I'll turn it over to you if there's any um, uh, additional conversation to be had. I, I wanna wish everybody a happy holiday break and um, thank everybody for their work. Um, there's December will still be a busy month with subcommittee activities and re, and then reviewing in early January the interim report. So um, thanks in advance for all the additional hours you're going to put in on this important effort. So with that I'm going to sign off and um, apologies that I have to run to a legislative breakfast that we're hosting. Thank you Elise. 
All righty. Uh, we're at the tail end of our meeting. Um, you know, the last two um, items or really last one is, do we have any other member comments or any other member or any other matters that we need to discuss before we adjourn, um, be that from staff as well? Can I make just one observation? The, the group at CU that we use for all of our economic projections and things like that, the, there was a report that came out from them uh, as to why the economic recovery and the and the recovery of em, employee jobs and things like that may be stretched out over several years and that this isn't something that as soon as everybody gets vaccinated or we reach you know that herd immunity level all those jobs are going to come back and this ties in also to the to the use of real estate in downtown as well uh, a lot of jobs are going to continue to be remote jobs and so it is going to be a real challenge for rtd to recover ridership it's going to take some I think out of the box thinking and some innovative uh, plans there. Thanks, Rhett. Dea? Crystal, if, if I could just make an offering, um, I think to Rhett's point, one thing that I've heard just through the grapevine is that several um, businesses and universities are starting to um, change their eco pass structure or not necessarily, they are not looking to. Um, to up uh, for next year. And so as RTD is getting in those numbers, it might be helpful for this committee to get an update on what the EcoPass um, uptake is for 2021 and kind of what's on what's on the minds of businesses, especially um, as we start to roll into 2021 and the longer term economic recovery. Okay, um, are you thinking a similar presentation to the one made at the operations subcommittee? Yes, I think that's great. Right. Okay, um, if staff will make a note of that um, for future conversations, I do think that would be helpful. And I guess if I could just add on to that, um, if there are any plans for RTD to look at a different type of program uh, next year, because everything I'm hearing in Lone Tree is that we're not gonna see our the folks coming back to the office campuses until mid-year. So is there a mid-year eco pass? Is there or is there a half price? You get the full year, but you're only paying for half of the year or something like that. I'd love to understand that as well. Cool. Thank you, Jackie. Any other comments? Staff? Nope, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Um, looks like we are good to go. Sorry, we went a little bit over. Um, we do try to be respectful of your time. But again, uh, same uh, same message as the co-chair Jones. Thank you all for all of your work. I hope you all have a happy holiday season. Um, and we'll be seeing you in our uh, subcommittees and then reconvening next year. So cheers. Thanks all. Cheers. Merry holidays. <laughs> I'm the last man standing here. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out how to get out of this one. This is a little different than the other one. So I'm with you on this, but as soon as I find the button, I'll tell you where it is. Yeah, I, I'm having a little trouble here. So. I'll go ahead and end the meeting for both of you so you don't have to worry All right. about it. Thank you. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Have a good day. You too. Bye bye. <laughs>